Well, good morning, everybody. Wanted to say good morning and thank you for attending. We've got our kind of sort of April webinar, and here we are in May. So I'm I'm Steve and Dennis here. So thank you again for uh, for joining us. We've got a good amount of information to to come up and go. Once I can advance the slide. There we go. So we've got a lot that we're going to cover. Um, and we're going to start off, you know, kind of saying how Mother Nature can be kind of, a, she can be kind of a jerk sometimes. But the reality is she's in control. So we have to deal with what she's going to throw at us. So we need to have a better idea of what goes on with the plants um, and when they are stressed, when those weird events happen. Um, what happens? So we're going to start off kind of talking about the general stress responses of plants. We're going to look at the hormones a little bit, reactive oxygen species and chemistry, and talk a little bit about root morphology and how um, some of those shifts and changes can be beneficial for the, the plant. And they can be driven by those plant growth promoting rhizobacteria. Uh, then we're going to move into talking more specifically about some of the abiotic stresses, those mother nature stresses. Um, those non-living stresses that can occur. And we're going to look at some specific examples, some, some interesting uh, research, some interesting information, kind of drill down a little bit deeper and look at some of those interesting little uh, factoids. You know, last uh, month in the webinar, which was the March webinar, because this is the April sure. webinar day. You can pretend. Yeah. Uh, you know, we talked a lot about in that webinar how these uh, plant growth promoting rhizobacteria make nutrient availability. Mm -hmm. They build soil structure. They do all these things. And sometimes we focus, I think, based on the biological communities within that soil environment, just based off of soil health. And we don't really think really how much deeper it actually goes and what these organisms do when we see these environmental stresses. Yeah. So there's a, I mean, there's a lot of information here. We're going to jump around a lot as we go through this presentation. And we are. We're going to kind of touch on things and bounce around. We usually try to have a bit of a, a flow. This one, it's just kind of touching on some of those topics. So uh, be, be ready to, to, I guess, kangaroo around. Let's, let's jump kangaroo. around and have some fun. So so starting off, you know, we, wah, we did wah. this last time. Doom and gloom. Wah, wah, a good old Debbie Downer. But... That's that's kind of what we're seeing. We're seeing globally soil degradation is it's it's downright scary. There is a lot going on. And as we start to scan across the globe and look at this, we see a lot of these agricultural areas are having a lot of soil degradation. Some of these areas are very unstable and a lot of them are in the degraded zone and that doesn't appear to be changing. Um, if anything, a lot of these areas, it's accelerating. So we really have to pay close attention to what is going on and how we're treating um, those soils and that agricultural land. And it's, it, it's easy for us, we live in the U.S., it's easy for us to drill down and focus on the U.S., isn't it? Yeah, and you know, so much of this in modern agriculture, we talk about we're degrading basically our topsoil, as Steve just talked about, but we're losing one inch of topsoil every decade. And it takes mother nature, you know, 500 to 1,000 years, yeah. we don't have that much no. time in agriculture to make these changes. We have to speed that process up. <laughs> and if we think about it, soil in the Midwest is eroding 10 to 1,000 times faster than we originally thought. And this is all based a lot on soil structure, yep. soil health, and yep. agricultural practices. Yep. You know, so often I talk about habitat. Mm -hmm. I drill down on building habitat for these microbial communities. We're losing the habitat. We are. We have to do something. And a prime example of this is, uh, you know, the drought that we talked about in Kansas right now, or we're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, this is what we're seeing. I mean, we're going to play this video if it'll play, maybe. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, this is happening in Kansas two days ago. Uh, you can kind of see this is a dust storm. I oh, mean, yeah. It's reminiscent of the uh, old days of the, the, uh, the dust, bowl. dust bowl. It's it's scary. And that is all topsoil. That is all soil that's being lost. And once it's lost, like we were just talking about, 
it can take a very long time for that soil to be reformed. A lot of that has to do with our agricultural practices, and we can speed that up. And that's a lot of what we like to talk about. This regenerative agricultural processes, this biological agriculture is a way that we can kind of counteract some of that. But we have to do it purposefully, and it, it takes steps. It takes effort, and it takes a lot of thought. It takes a lot of management in order for us to be able to move in that direction and it's important for farmers to kind of keep in mind that some of the things that have been done in the past, after that chemical revolution, um, better, better growing through chemistry um, after World War II, has led us down some pathways that are going to be hard for us to counteract. We have to get back on the right path, and that's going to take some time and effort. And on top of that, we have some other issues that are going on with our, our global weather patterns and our climate patterns. And this is one of the things that we're seeing um, here. We're seeing these trends in heavy precipitation. Yeah. And so, you know, as we lose our topsoil, as we lose that structure to hold this water, yes. we're getting the same amount of rain that we've always had in the past. It's mm -hmm. not like our rain levels if you got 20 inches of rain you're still getting 20 inches of rain but it's coming in three storms yeah or four storms mm -hmm. and so we see that heavy precipitation we've seen that over the last decade this is from research from dr hatfield mm -hmm. um and we look at that and so this creates a, not only an environmental impact but it also creates an agriculture impact of how we manage our crop and how these crops go through those stress periods that we're going to kind of build and talk about here as we go through. And we see that not only in, you know, basically it's all across the globe. I mean, we talk about California mm -hmm. over the last, you know, four or five years, it's been in a severe drought as we see up here in the upper left, you know, let a, a reduction in precipitation. Mm -hmm. Up in the Midwest, we saw excessive precipitation. And now we've seen that kind of flip where now California has had record snowfall, record rains. We have flooding. We have all kinds of crops that are underwater. And the Midwest is now in a drought type scenario within uh, those growing environments. So it really um, creates a problem. And that's one of the reasons why we want to talk about all of these things that the biological impact and how important these are beyond just that mm -hmm. nutrient availability, all these other things that can help you get a window of opportunity to, to grow through these environmental changes. Well, and everything's interconnected, like you talked about last time, and, and you really hit that, that nail on the head with reminding us that you can't isolate one thing. So we're talking about dust and blowing and, and uh, soil degradation. And then we're talking about precipitation and moisture changes. You can't isolate those. Those are so interconnected when it comes to how our fields function and our infiltration capacity. As we degrade that soil structure, we're getting those heavy rain events and the soil just can't handle it, which is compounding even more erosion. Well, it, yeah, it's like what I talked about here on this picture of the upper left of California through that severe mm -hmm. drought. And now we go to that major rain. And one of the things that's really cool when you start to think about this, this is Tulare Lake in California. All right. I did not know, but it is once the largest freshwater lake west of the Mississippi. I had no idea. Yeah. In 1898, they diverted the rivers, mm -hmm. they dammed them. And so Tulare Lake dried up. It became very fertile agricultural ground. Watch your language. I know it. And now with the rains that they've had in California for the first time in over 100 years, you can see this is in about a 60 day period of time. That's two months. Two months. That's crazy. That Tulare Lake went from a dry bed mm -hmm. agriculture to reforming as a lake. This is all underwater now. The lake is back. And it, it's not like they changed the flow of the rivers. This is all from excessive moisture yep. coming into this agriculture environment. Yep. And I mean, when you start to, I mean, that's devastating to those growers who weren't able to plant their crops this year. And granted, microbes aren't going to help us grow through that. I guess if we planted rice, we might be okay. But strawberries <laughs> aren't going to work. Yeah, a lot of the, the normal crops and a lot of the normal practices, they're just not going to work when that area is literally a lake. Yeah. 
But, you know, some of the stuff we'll talk about today kind of gives us a little bit of insight of how biology can actually help us through some of these. And that's really what we're, it is. Weird. With that, we should have named the presentation. That. I, I think you're right. And then as we start to look at, um, so we just talked about rain events. We've talked about soil degradation. And then more doom and gloom. Man, we are just Debbie Downers. Um, as we look at this stair-step climb, we see decade after decade after decade, the global temperature, and we can look at the U.S., we can look at the global, we're seeing these temperature increases year after year, decade after decade, and it's not in just one small area. We see a few small areas that, hey, Mississippi, Alabama, they, they're not doing so bad, but then we look at the rest of the U.S., and we think about where are growing, where our major crops are being grown. We've got our Midwest areas. We've got our coastal areas. They are raising in temperature, which leads to even more compounded issues. We've talked about how the moisture is coming in heavier events and it's changing. We're having heavy, strong moisture uh, events, those rain events. But we also need to keep in mind as we raise this temperature above the crop, Warm air holds more moisture. That's just the way it is. That is science. That is the physics of it. So as we increase the temperature above the crop, that means that the moisture above that uh, field goes up. And where is it coming from? Mostly from evapotranspiration. Those plants need to cool themselves, and they do it basically the same way we do. When you go outside and it's hot, your body starts to sweat. We do it a little bit different. We move salt outside of ourselves. Our body transports um, those salt ions and it causes just osmosis. Water follows that salt. Plants do it a little bit different. They're using uh, hydrogen bonding and uh, capillary action to move that water up through themselves where it can be deposited on the leaves or it can become evaporated from those stomata and from that leaf area. But it's leading to even more moisture loss just to hold on to uh, that moisture becomes more of a challenge for the plant because it has to deal with those higher temperatures. It has to deal with soil degradation and it has to deal with that moisture loss. And then on top of that, we've got other weird things going on. Uh, you know, I see this actually because we think, well, we have 19 uh, less frost-free days. Sounds awesome. Yeah, down in the California area, up in the Washington, Oregon area, 10 in the Midwest. And you think about that and you think about, you know, oh, that's great. I can get planted earlier. But when I look at it um, from the standpoint of the fruit industry, for example, California, Washington, Colorado, where we deal with a lot of these fruit trees, we still have 19, um, basically, fewer frost-free days. But the latest frost is still changed. exactly yep. the same. Yep. So what happens on a lot of these early varieties, they come out earlier but we're still susceptible to that frost for yep. a longer period of time. And, you know, Bruce used to talk about that a little bit, and we'll go into that a little mm -hmm. bit as we go through this presentation of what things as growers can we do when we start to talk about these, again, environmental impacts, these yep. environmental conditions. Um, because frost, obviously, as we all know, can be devastating to a fruit crop. Oh, Cherries, absolutely. Peaches, if, apples. If it yeah. hits at the wrong time during bloom, you can lose your entire crop. So this... This sounds great, awesome, we have more time to grow, but the reality is because we're not having those frost-free days change along with these, um, these temperature changes, we're setting ourselves up and our, set, our crops are being set up. And we've had that happen here just last year. We saw yeah. some frost and Colorado saw some Col frost and damage. Well, we've, se we've seen that with the unusual weather that's going on in California right yep. now with the nut crop. Um, yeah. So yeah, so it's... it's uh, all across the country that we have to, and part of the reason we're talking about all these things as, as a grower that we kind of put all of these in the back of our head mm -hmm. and how do we manage these? Because again, we talk about managing stress yeah. to increase yield. And that's really why we're kind of building, I guess we call this the foundation mm -hmm. as we go into the presentation. And it all basically boils down to things are getting weird. We got some weirdness going on and there are scientists that are referring to this as climate weirdness, weather weirdness that's going on. It's it's less the idea of climate change, although that is still happening. It's just things are getting bizarre. We're having jet streams that are shifting and moving. We're having these 
bomb cyclones. We're having these freeze events. We're having this heavy, heavy frost. We're having hail. It's just getting downright weird out there. And the hard part is a plant can't decide where it's going to go. I mean, as a, as a farmer, you can decide where you're going to plant things. And sometimes as those environments shift and change, you have to change what's being planted to accommodate that more uh, norm or that new norm you're seeing and what your weather and global patterns um, are looking like. But the reality is this, this tree that's up here in this frosty area or these trees that are down here in this super salty warm area, they can't choose to stand up, walk away and move. They're stuck there. Uh, according to Ian, Ian Baldwin of Max Planck Institute, plants genome has probably an order of magnitude more genes involved in environmental perception than most animals do. Most plants have to. They have to really tune their physiology and biochemistry to what is going on, and they need a very sophisticated system of perception and response. They have to be able to deal with that stress because they are stuck there. And how do they deal with that. Well, as things get weird, weirdness and the, the temperature, the moisture, the losses, they all lead to stress. And that's kind of what Dennis was talking about. We have to manage that stress. To maximize our yield, we want to minimize our stress. A stressed plant that does not have beneficial organisms, we see changes in a few of its phytohormones, basic acid and ethylene. Those are going up. Our reactive oxygen species, which we'll talk about a little bit more, that's also going up and that leads to more damage to the plant. And because of this, we're seeing a decrease in nutrient uptake. And all of this leads to a yield loss. On the other side, when we have some of these plant growth promoting resin bacteria to help protect the plant, we see reductions in abscisic acid, ethylene, reactive oxygen species, and we see better nutrient uptake. Well, and if you go back to that better nutrient uptake, this is what I talked about basically yeah. last month in the webinar. Oh, yeah. And part of that was we say tests don't guess. Mm -hmm. You grab that information from yeah. a plant sap analysis because so often what we think the plant needs at this time, especially under environmental stresses, may not be what the plant actually wants. It may not want more nitrogen, even though it's in that cycle of a vegetative growth because of drought stress. And if we put that nitrogen on, all we're creating is more stress we in that plant. Them. We yeah. compounded the problem. And so you have to think about this under environmental conditions, whether it's flood, whether it's heat, whether it's drought, um, what the plant may want may be different than in an actual great uh, growing environment when we have all the right conditions. So again, test, don't guess, don't forget to mm -hmm. make sure we're giving the plant the nutrition that it needs. Well, and it's, it's nutritional needs change during those times. And we'll talk a little bit about some of those, uh, in, those critical trace minerals um, that are responsible for helping protect that plant. So looking back and thinking back to what uh, Dr. Ian Baldwin said, these receptors, and that's what's going on here. The plant has a wide variety of different receptors on the outside of its leaves to be able to respond to what's going on. It has to be able to sense a temperature shift. It has to be able to sense a moisture shift in order to be able to react to it. And that's what these receptors are doing. So we have these plant growth regulators that are being triggered by these different receptors, and it causes an uptick and upregulation of certain production of different phytohormones, ethylene, the brassinosteroids, salicylic acid, we see gismonic acid. Um, and so this plant is using these signaling molecules to try to protect itself and try to move itself out of that stress, or at least be able to try to get to reproduction without losing as much as it can. It wants to maintain as much of that yield as it possibly can. So these phytohormones in general, looking across different plants, they all have kind of basic functions. Some of them are responsible for germination, growth, flowering, fruit development, abscission, seed dormancy. So there's these classifications that all plants are using these different hormones for fairly specific things. Uh, and when we start to incorporate incorporate the plant growth running rise bacteria, they're doing a lot of things. Um, we're going to talk about EPS a little bit and these extracellular polysaccharides. Man, we kind of hammered a lot because it's incredible 
all of what is going on with these glues that the microbes use. These microbes are also generating, they're producing phytohormones themselves. They are directly communicating with the plant what's going on. If a microbe is sensing moisture stress in the soil environment, it's going to respond in the same way. It's going to recognize that moisture stress. And a lot of times, because they're on a much smaller scale than the plant or the plant root, they sense that moisture stress more quickly than the plant will. And so they can produce the phytohormones to kind of tune that plant into the stress that's on its way. It's kind of like doing sap analysis. It gives us a little bit of a window into the future. Um, and some of these molecules, ACCD aminase, for example, helps reduce some of those um, stress molecules. It helps break down uh, the precursor to ethylene so that plant doesn't have as much ethylene, which is decreasing its stress response. Um, a lot of the volatile organic compounds of EOCs these microbes produce are communicating with the plant. Um, and it's also these microbes help the plant accumulate osmolites. Osmolites are molecules that help reduce water loss through osmosis. Osmosis is just moisture movement from a high concentration to low concentration. Everything in nature wants to be balanced. So if I have a salty environment outside of the plant, compared to the inside of the plant, osmosis says that moisture is going to, water is going to move to try to balance that. So it's going to move from inside the plant out. These osmolites that the microbes produce, they use them for themselves to keep their own moisture, but they also feed them to the plant, which is just incredible, helping the plant hold on to more water. Antioxidants, so we're going to talk about reactive oxygen species um, and upregulation, downregulation of stress response genes like we were talking about. That plant responds with these receptors and it changes its phytohormone response based on the stresses. These microbes are producing the exact same molecules to communicate and alterations in root morphology and acquisition of drought tolerance. So these microbes, they can sense different micro pockets in the soil environment. Soil is not homogenous. You have different pockets. You might have a slightly higher organic matter content or slightly higher clay content in different pockets. Those microbes sense that. And with this communication, they can actually encourage the plant's roots to grow towards those areas that are better suited for growth. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, I was going to talk a little bit about reactive oxygen species. If you remember that, we talked about that last time. We've talked about it last several times when, in regards to the rhizophagy cycle. The plant is using these reactive oxygen species, remember, to break down the cell wall of those microbes. That's a good thing. That's what's supposed to happen. However, when stress is going on, whether it's biotic or abiotic, and plant is using biotic uh, reactive oxygen species to help fight um, different phytopathogens. Um, and it's doing the same thing we do. When you get sick, your immune system cells are producing large quantities of reactive oxygen species to bombard whatever is making you sick, to help tear it apart and break it apart. That's a good thing. That's what's supposed to happen. The problem is in stress environment, the plant starts to overproduce these. And when that happens, we can see problems. We can see damage that starts to happen. We can see membrane disruption and every plant cell, every organelle, every structure in the plant is surrounded by a membrane. This reactive oxygen species can damage those membranes. Uh, peroxisomes are necessary for breaking down materials. The plant kind of uses those as a recycling center. We can damage those and these peroxisomes are producing peroxide, which can uh, be used by the plant to help break things down, but we also start to see leakage of some of this can lead to more damage, and we can see alterations in gene expression. Uh, the chloroplasts themselves, which are the site of photosynthesis, can be damaged, and these, uh, these thylakoid stacks and these sensitive structures inside of the chloroplast can be damaged by the reactive oxygen species. Like I mentioned, cell wall. We can also see de degradation of mitochondria. Mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. It's where the energy um, production occurs. ATP is synthesized here. Uh, so we want to see, like I was talking about, in a healthy state, we have a balance of reactive oxygen species in antioxidants, whether that's in the plant, whether it's in the microbe, whether it's in you, me, my dog, a cat, a chicken, that's just the way this system is designed to work. The plant uses these as a communication molecule, but it also uses them to help protect itself from pathogens. Um, but the problem is when that cascade event starts to happen, we have too much stress, 
and there's an overgeneration of reactive oxygen species, it goes out of control and we have too much. And like I was talking about, we can have damage to our lipids, our amino acids, our proteins. Uh, we see cellular damage, membrane destruction, loss of organelle function, like the chloroplast, like we were talking about, reduced carbon fixation, reduced photosynthesis, like we were saying. And it can lead all the way to, down the, the line to program cell death, apoptosis. If a plant has too much reactive oxygen species and too much stress in that form, it can actually cause the cells to die, which can lead to massive yield loss. If a plant dies, the yield loss is pretty extreme, don't you think? Hey, it can get kind of bad that yep. way. Yep. Yeah. Once well, the plant's dead, it's hard to get yield. Yeah. And all of these things you talk about are all the things that we try and promote in agriculture. If we start to talk about our amino acids and yep. our lipids, we yep. always try and promote that. We talk about photosynthesis. We're always trying to do things to mm -hmm. increase that photosynthesis. So all of these things are a balance, as you said, that we have to manage. And so much of that is done within that soil environment. Yes. We don't even see it no. happening. No. It's one of those results, like, again, with biology, that is very hard to measure, but happens on a daily basis in agriculture that we don't even think of. It's a microscopic scale. We have no idea. If, if it gets, the damage gets so great that we see it, it is run out of control. So most of this is dealt with by these organisms, by the plant, before we even have a chance to see it. Uh, and remember, we were talking a lot last time about nutrient acquisition. These enzymes that are necessary for breaking down the reactive oxygen species in the plant, as well as the microbe, these microbes have the exact same pathways. So the reactive oxygen species scavenging systems, those antioxidants, asorbate, glutathione, carotenoids, alpha tocopherols, prolines, flavonoids, and phenolic compounds, as well as enzymatic, we have our catalase, we have our superoxide dismutase, as well as some of these other materials, these other enzymes that are designed to break down these reactive oxygen species. These microbes, they have the same system. So they are generating these same enzymes. So not only are they producing them, they're also gathering the trace minerals that are needed for the core metal ion to make these enzymes function. We have our copper, our selenium, our iron, manganese, zinc, nickel, etc. All of these are necessary for the plant to utilize those. And once we take into account the idea of rhizophagy, where these microbes are queued up, they have their own stress they're dealing with. They've accumulated some of these materials. They built the enzymes and they've accumulated these trace minerals. And now we, with rhizophagy, they're being dumped directly into the plant. That plant gets a great boost without having to generate any of this itself. You know, last month, the webinar, we gave the, I gave that slide and we talked a little bit about the human body, the plant. Yep and the microorganisms within that soil mm -hmm. environment. And the need between each one of those are exactly the same. Yeah. And this is really kind of tying that together. Yep. It talks about but where do the plants get their trace minerals from that microbial community, from that soil, yep. you know, within that soil environment. So much we stress about how important these trace minerals are. Oh, yeah. It's not only for the plant. Yes, they're needed for the plant, but it's also needed for that biological world mm -hmm. to actually function and those enzymes to function as designed. Oh, absolutely. Now, the Dr. Huber's um, book, Trace Minerals and Plant Disease, um, that is a great book. It, it really digs deep into what each of these are doing. So if, you, if you're looking for a heavy read, but a very interesting read, find that book and check it out because it goes into a lot of the individual functions of these different um, minerals. Okay, so I have this one up. It, it's going a lot of depth. There's a lot of enzymes that it's talking about, a lot of the actual response, but I wanted to highlight this because whenever I'm doing research and I find where there are question marks, I just love it because that means that although we are very sophisticated and we figured a lot of this stuff out, there's still a lot of areas that we don't fully understand what all is going on. And for me, that's just a strong reminder of whenever we think we know better than nature, oh, we're going to get slapped. And sometimes we get slapped hard. We have to let nature fix nature. And that's the whole idea behind regenerative agriculture is building these systems so the systems can take care of themselves. Yeah. You've talked a lot about communication. Yeah. And so much of that is... And when, when we look at something like this and we don't have an understanding with, you know, we see up there calcium, we see question marks, mm -hmm. we don't know this whole process. 
you know, so much of that comes if we let the biological world actually do it as it was designed and based off that communication. We talk all the time about plants communicating to that microbial environment based on the rhizophagy cycle of plant need. I mean, they're telling that yep. underground world, this is what we want, rather than us force feeding a lot of times what mm -hmm. I talk about, what we think the plant wants. Let's encourage that system to basically function as designed and then make changes based off the information that we receive on our testing oh, yeah. to, as we say, feed weekly, weekly. Mm -hmm. I don't know who says that. Somebody says it a lot. I've I heard somebody it. say it once or twice. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, go down that path in order to balance the nutrition. Oh, absolutely. And that is the great way to do it. It's, it's kind of like the idea of like our autonomic system. If I had to control my pulse, my heart, my breathing, all of that, if I had to be in control of it, I'd be in trouble. Yeah. I'd forget. It'd be bad. So we've got to let these natural systems take care of themselves. And it gets worse when you get to be my age. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so another one that I'd like to point out, induced systemic tolerance. This is the idea of simply having these organisms present because they are in the soil they are sensing what's going on in the soil. And a lot of times, like I said, they'll sense it faster than the plant will. They're responding and they're producing communication molecules, these volatile organic compounds, and they spit them out. And they're spitting them out as communication between their, their cells, between them and the plant. And the plant uses them as well. The plant can communicate um, with some of these molecules as well. But utilizing these microorganisms in the soil and allowing them to create that communication pathway, it prepares the plant for what's coming, which I think is really exciting. And there's biochemical pathways, biochemical responses that are going on. And I wanted to focus, I wanted to point out one more that's kind of interesting. Um, when a stress is happening, like we talk about when you have bare soil and the sun is beating down, your soil temperatures start to go through the roof. And we talk about protein breakdown. You start to have uh, denaturation, denaturation, Naturification. Sure, we'll say that. Of, of, those, <laughs> a bit of, <laughs> of, of those proteins, um, there, there's a way that these organisms and the plant can protect it. They're called heat shock proteins, and these are synthesized to help protect those molecules and help protect those structures. So these microbes, again, they have the same need, and they're going to feed some of these to the plant as well. And it's just incredible how sensitive these systems are. And we can focus in on some of the individual molecules. Like I talked about um, before, some of these osmolites and these osmoprotectants. Glycine betaine is an effective stabilizer, is, is effective in stabilizing the quaternary structure of enzymes and complex proteins in protecting various components of photosynthetic machinery. So this is a molecule that is synthesized by the plant as well as these microbes, these plant growth promoting rhizobacteria are synthesizing the glycine betaine themselves. And again, through rhizophagy, they feed it to the plant. But not only that, they can upregulate the synthesis of glycine betaine to help that plant protect itself. So they're stimulating the transcription of these molecules to help protect. Uh, and we're seeing protection of the rubisco and the rubisco synthesis. Rubisco is critical for photosynthesis. This molecule helps the balance of sodium potassium. It's protecting the membrane integrity and it's activating host defense. This is one molecule that's being produced by these microbes that causes a big cascade, a huge trigger of events to help that plant protect itself. And I mentioned a little bit before this idea of our soil isn't homogenous. We have different pockets in our soil. And when our soil environment changes, if I have really hot soil slightly farther down, deeper into the soil, it's going to be a bit cooler. These microbes sense that and they can encourage the plant to grow. Like I've mentioned, you know, we usually think if you build it, they will come. But with these PGPR, you need to have them. You need to add them so that they can build it. Modifications at organ, cellular, and molecular level of root systems and plant tissues get triggered by beneficial detrimental rhizosphere microorganisms through modifications of phytohormonal balance. These microbes are using these phytohormones to encourage the plant to grow where that soil is more conducive 
to its growth. Many PGPR by producing phytohormones, volatile organic compounds, secondary metabolites play an important role in influencing the root architecture and growth, resulting in increased surface area for nutrient exchange and other rhizosphere effects. Thus, PGPR are capable of modulating root traits and play an important role in agricultural sustainability. And these pictures kind of sum it up. This is not a naked root. This is a root that has a house built around it. And Dennis, you talk a lot about the idea of habitat. These microbes want a healthy habitat for them to grow in. It's like having your house in the winter. It's like having a shelter in the winter or the summer. It would be much more difficult for you to survive the winter without some sort of structure to keep you warm. Well, and you know, we talk about this. You've mentioned EPS Mm -hmm. Just a little bit. Yep. And so often we talk about these exopolar saccharides basically as the structures to build a home, to build this soil structure, kind of like we see around this. But it goes well beyond that, well beyond just building soil structure, as we've kind of talked about yeah. how important that is to that microbial community mm -hmm. and their functions within yes. that environment in the communication with the plant. So as we start to look at this, you know, a lot of times I talk to grower and you kind of say, you know, if we if you build it, they will come. But a lot of times we have to have them there in order to build it. This yes. is what I talk about all the time when we build mm -hmm. soil health is we can't, you know, a lot of the growers, I guess, that we talk about, you know, you think about Gabe Brown, you think about Rick Clark that have mm -hmm. done this. And a lot of that is without doing anything but the cover cropping and things like that. But mm -hmm. if we actually incorporate these microbial communities into that soil environment, we can get there much quicker. Oh yeah. With based off the root morphology mm -hmm. as we talk about is getting those roots down into that environment, yes. sending those microbes. That's why we talk about sending those organisms into that environment with a, a sack lunch. Yep. Give them food. Carbon, 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 carbon. Yeah. So that they can get going because the only way we build soil health is through these roots and these microbial activity. And we talk about on the rise of phagy cycle, how important the microbes are and that rhizophagy to root hair formation yes. on the plant. And we see that without these microbial communities, it does not form naturally. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, you know, so much of this is connected. Oh, it, it's, it's all interconnected. Yeah. And as we start to think about moisture holding capacity, we start talking about gas exchange. This zone, this structure that is built is ideal for those and pH. that's done on purpose ph shifts we can see two full ph point shifts and it's not just those root hairs uh, here's just you know like I, there's a little bit of research out there on how some of these pgpr modulate root morphology and it's not just the root hairs it can be the overall structure the lateral roots the brace roots all of these can be adjusted and somewhat dictated by these microbes to help that plant maximize its acquisition of nutrients so that it can photosynthesize as best as it possibly can, therefore sending more exudates down. These little guys, they're not dumb. They're little, but they're not dumb. They're, they're fairly self-serving. They want as much food as they can possibly get. And the way they get that is by keeping that plant as healthy as they possibly can. Okay, so that was kind of like we talked about some of the big structural changes that all plants were seeing, reactive oxygen species, phytohormones, some of the glycine betaine and other mole protective molecules. Now we're going to dig down a little bit like we talked about and focus on some interesting things that we can see when we start looking at some of these specific abiotic stresses. And man, look at the EPS, 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 EPS. We, we've talked about the, the, the critical nature of the extracellular polysaccharides, and this picture says it better than pretty much anything else can. These EPSs are there to do a wide variety of things. Temperature damping, helping reduce chloride levels, helping restrict and reduce sodium. Um, again, temperature damping, biofilm formation, sodium restriction, water availability, hold, water holding, um, and we're seeing so many other important changes that are all associated with that microbe's ability to encourage the roots to grow where they need to grow, changing that morphological state, as well as creating that soil structure on and around the root. So we can start to think about this and we view this idea as if we have an unaided response, we see decline. Without these beneficial organisms, if I have a saline stress, then I'm going to see disturbed osmotic and ion exchanges. When I do have these, and like we talked about, they're producing osmolites. They're helping reduce that stress response. 
So without these organisms, you are basically subjected to, or the plant is subjected to whatever the worst case scenario was going to be, whether that's chilling, whether that's drought, heat, high light, heavy metals, uh, and even submerged conditions. But when we start to see what can happen with these organisms, we start to find there's some incredible, uh, incredible outcomes that can happen. Microbial inoculation causes thermotolerance. Thermotolerance is just being able to survive through that heat. And this is uh, Shafiq et al. 2022. This is some pretty uh, recent research. Among abiotic stresses, heat stress is described as one of the major limiting factors of crop growth worldwide. As high temperatures elicit a series of physiological, molecular, and biochemical cascade events that ultimately result in reduced crop yield. And like we were talking about in the beginning during the Debbie Downer doom and gloom, we're seeing that stair step. We're seeing temperatures go up and up and up. There's growing interest among researchers in the use of beneficial microorganisms. Intricate and highly complex interactions between plants and microbes result in the alleviation of heat stress. All those things that we've been talking about. We see the outcomes that happen when we start looking at the physiological processes that these microbes can help with. Induce systemic resistance. They can help the stomata open and close. The thermotolerance. They can help improve photosynthesis and respiration. The molecular processes, the EPS production, delayed senescence, like we talked about a little bit with that ACC deaminase, those organisms are helping break down those stress molecules. Production of osmolites, helping reduce the osmosis temperature loss, phytohormonal modulation, VOCs and organic acid production. And all of this results in a plant that's able to survive in an environment that would otherwise probably lead to its demise. You know, and a lot of this I see actually out in the actual field. Now, granted, if we're in a severe drought and everything is going to die, biology can only do much. It's not so magic. It's a buffer. It's not exactly. magic. Yeah. It gives you that uh, two-week period of time for that rain event or weather conditions where you have the ex heavily saturated soil where, to mm -hmm. give that a chance to dry up. And we'll kind of talk about those. But here's an example of these were Honeycrisp apples in Colorado. I had met this grower. We were doing a root dip on mm -hmm. these, which is oh, absolutely one best. of my favorite. Yeah. If we want to get mycorrhizae and beneficial bacteria attached to that root zone at the time of planting, the root dip is an awesome way to do it. The you other have thing, access to the roots and you want these microbes on the roots. It's yeah. a no-brainer. And the, and the amazing part about that is we talk about how important these microbial communities are at the point of germination. Yes. Well, we're getting these trees. They've already germinated, they've already grown, they've mm -hmm. already been grafted, we receive them and then we're planting them. So biologically, we think a lot of times we're already behind because most of the trees have already most likely been treated with the fungicide yeah. before they were shipped to you. So everything that's there is, it's a clean slate. They're stressed right out of the gates. So anyway, uh, I'll move on. Uh, we, we met this, yeah, we met this grower, uh, went over the root dip, all the guys that were planting were there, the holes were dug. And we had to run off and look at another field. So mm -hmm. got them set up. We took off. We were gone about 25 or 30 minutes. And this was about an 89 degree day with a 20 mile an hour wind. It was not ideal, I guess, for planting new trees. Well, these, it was, bear, these bare yeah. red babies. And so when we got back with the grower, we pulled up and my jaw dropped because what the planters had done is taken every one of these trees, root dipped them, and laid them in front well, of the hole. That's what you said to do, right? They laid every tree out up and down the row, mm -hmm. root dipping it without planting it. Yep. And uh, the grower obviously wasn't very happy. He knows how important it is to keep those roots from drying out, yeah. especially on a day like oh, that. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we got all the trees planted, got them watered in, and, you know, he was fed, said he would be unhappy if he would have seen 60% survival rate of these trees, especially of the ones that were dipped early and yep. laid as they went down the full length. Of they the were field. dry and crispy. Yeah. Yep. Um, amazingly enough, we had 100% success rate on these trees. I said 99.9. .9. There was one tree that he had to prune back, but it, there were it did. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but he, to this day, is convinced that these trees, this orchard would not be here today. There would be multiple skips within that orchard had it not been for the root dip scenario. And it comes just down to that buffer that All that biological yep. community can give you, that little window of opportunity mm -hmm. to 
basically make up for either environment or an error that we do as a grower. All these things that they do. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I talked a little bit about in uh, Kansas mm -hmm. last year, when we start to talk about that stress, the environmental stresses, uh, picture here on the left with thousands of acres that I looked at with the field scout that yeah. did not pollinate properly. Mm -hmm. And here on the right were the fields that we looked at with the grower that's using these regenerative practices. Some of these fields were like literally side by side. Yeah. In fact, there was one field that I wanted to get a picture of, but they cut it for silage before the day before we got there. So we didn't get the picture <laughs> of uh, it. Um, but the amazing part about this, it goes down the whole idea that the field scout said is what had happened on these uh, corn plants that did not pollinate properly is the pollen tubes collapsed in mm -hmm. that heat event. They stressed yep. enough, they collapsed, so they did not get complete pollination. Where the regenerative grower, the pollen tubes did not collapse. It, with that heat event, they were able to work through that stresses. Yep. Part of that is through that biological that we were talking about, all oh, yeah. those things that biological mm -hmm. community can do to help reduce stress. Yep. But it also comes down to the nutrition, the Where availability the nutrition? of nutrition through that microbial to do within that soil environment. <laughs> and so we had proper cell development to yep. help the rigidity of those cells to stand up based off of that heat event. Higher calcium, higher silica. Yep, exactly. So it really comes down to, again, that window of opportunity that we don't even see happen. We don't understand that basically we dodged a bullet um, when it came to an environmental factor, because we don't see it until we have a side-by-side -side scenario like this, where we see thousands of acres that didn't do it, and basically thousands of acres that were able to yep. work through this. Survive through yeah. it. All right, ready? Yeah. Kangaroo hop, we are switching now from the heat to alleviation of cold, plant growth promoting rhizobacteria, mechanisms and alleviation of cold stress in plants. The ability is psychotolerant, and psychotolerant just means they're cold tolerant. There's also psychrophilic microbes that love growing in cold. Bacteria to survive and proliferate at low temperatures implies that they have devised a number of mechanisms that help them to tide over transient cold. These adaptations include lipid modifications to maintain mem membrane fluidity. I mean, think about when like a plastic is cold, it's more likely to snap. Right. The, this, these cell walls of the microbes, cell walls of the plant are the same. So they have ways that they can work through that. Synthesis and utilization of cryoprotectants, cold adapted enzymes, synthesis of reactive oxygen species, detoxifying, ice binding proteins. And that's a, a very interesting one that I wanted to kind of focus and poke at a little bit. Low temperature growth, freezing survival, and production of antifreeze proteins by plant growth promoting rhizobacterium pseudomonas Cutita. So what we're seeing here is these are organisms that can survive in this environment, and they can actually help the plant grow through this environment. And what they're seeing is these microbes are producing antifreeze proteins. These are materials that restrict and reduce the amount of ice nucleation that can happen. Ice requires a nucleation point. Um, sometimes we talk about like Pseudomonas syringii. Up in the clouds, you can find it. And on the plants, they're causing an ice crystal to form so that they can have an easier access. If I can split open a plant and degrade a little bit of that plant with that ice, then now all, all of a sudden it's very easy for that disease, that pathogen to move in. So this is an organism that can help reduce that by, pre, by creating some of these cryoprotectants and these antifreeze molecules. He report the bacterium was able to grow and promote elongation of both spring and winter canola at five degrees Celsius. That's just above 40 degrees Fahrenheit, a temperature at which only a relatively small number of bacteria are able to proliferate and function. So these are organisms that can help that plant grow in this environment and help protect it from some of that ice crystal formation. In addition, the bacteria survive exposure to freezing temperatures of negative 20 to negative 50 degrees Celsius. That is just incredible. That is a temperature at which the water should be frozen and should be ice crystal. However, these organisms are able to produce those molecules and share some of those molecules with the plant to allow it to grow. Well, and you know, early on, we were talking about that late frost, mm -hmm. but those frost-free days have changed 19 days, for an example, like in California and stuff. So a lot of times when I look at the orchard industry, Bruce used to talk about the idea of a foliar application yeah. 
just before one of these freeze events. And that's kind of a little bit of what he's talking about. Yeah, the, the potassium um, to help with sugar translocation. Sugar itself is an antifreeze molecule. So if we can help that plant synthesize more sugar, higher photosynthesis, all of these work together, as well as some of these organisms directly helping reduce ice crystal formation, as well as we talk about soil temperatures Temperature. that are associated with life. Life generates heat, breakdown of materials, breakdown of cellulose generates water and it generates heat. Yeah, and this is a golf course in Colorado. The golf course superintendent called me up and said I had to come out and take a look at this and I took a picture of it. This was golf course greens across the entire course that he had had on a biological program. None of the fairways or tees or anything. He was utilizing the same products or program. Mm -hmm. um, he could not believe that the snow had melted off all of the greens. Again, just the greens. Just the greens mm -hmm. because of the a little bit of an increase in soil temperature mm -hmm. based off of that cellul di cellulose digestion. And a lot of times we talk about that when we talk about that biological community making nutrition available yep. to that plant early in yep. the springtime when that plant needs it. It really needs it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what we're seeing. It's a digestive process. You can see these greens are very green um, in this picture, no fertilizer. They hadn't been fertilized yet. Yeah. The only thing that had been done to these is one biological application, but it was a program that he had been doing for working, years. Working the system. Same yeah. thing as this is the different course up in the Lafayette area. Um, and the exact same thing. Uh, the superintendent here, I look at when I talk to a golf course superintendent, their yield basically their income is number of rounds. Yep. Basically, the more rounds that they can get, the more golfers they can get on their course, the higher their yield. And so when we start to look at this again, this is a golf course green. You can see the fairways haven't even come out of dormancy yet. They've no. mowed them, they've cleaned them up. But part of that is because people drive by and they see these beautiful greens and they want to come play golf there. That's your putting surface. That's really what matters. I always say on a golf course industry, if someone's complaining about the uh, ball washer on the towel, you know your green's in pretty <laughs> good shape. Um, but it comes down to, I mean, he, he basically he would turn green earlier in the spring and go dormant later in the fall because of the basically balanced nutrition, microbial community. You know, I always put up my Christmas lights the day after Thanksgiving. One time I was mm -hmm. in Colorado putting up my Christmas lights and the neighbor stopped me and he said, you know, Dennis, I'm, I'm really upset with you. And I'm thinking, oh no, not again. What, what, did what I have now? I done now? Um, he said, your grass right now is greener on Thanksgiving than mine was at any part of the summer. <laughs> and it's true. Those are the type of expression we start to see once we really get this system functioning as designed. We allow those plants to grow deeper into the season. We allow them to germinate earlier. And you've had examples where you see farmers and fields that are germinating earlier. They're yeah. the last in and first to germinate. Okay, so now we're going to hop again. And I now want a tigger. Because he's bouncy, 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 rather than kangaroo. The, the wonderful thing about tigger, yeah, well, tigers are wonderful things. Uh, so wet, wet and wild. When we talk about moisture, we need to keep in mind it is the strongest predictor of yields, pretty much hands down. If a plant, it's as simple as if a plant has too much or not enough water, we have a yield decline. We have this butter zone. We have this Goldilocks zone where when we have the plant has the right amount of water at the right time, it is maximizing its yield. And that is a big part of why NRCS um, is encouraging the generation of organic matter. Uh, No-till farmers, uh, cover crop, all of these are done to produce more organic because we have to have that organic matter to hold on to moisture. And we talked about EPS, and I think we've said EPS and EPS and EPS, and how critical that is for holding on and creating that structure to help hold on to that moisture. Recently, a modeling study by William et al. has shown that the period from 2000 to 2018 was the driest phase since the late 1500s. And consequently, many regions in the United States may be on the verge of entering mega drought period. Severe drought has already been experienced in western part of the United States in the last few years. Model projections show robust drying and increase in extreme drought in many regions around the world by the end of the 21st century, including regions in America, Europe, Asia, and Australia. Plus, like that graph that I showed, as the temperature goes up, evaporate, evapotranspiration has to go up because that can hold more water, which compounds this drying event.
A soil moisture is the most restricting element in dry cultivating and dry land practices. Whenever transpiration exceeds the water uptake, stress prevails in plants. Evapotranspiration equals evaporation plus transpiration, moving that moisture out of the plant. Moisture stress affects all aspects of growth and affects water relation to plants, photosynthesis, respiration, metabolic reaction, hormonal reaction, nutrient growth, development, and yield. Pretty much everything. everything. <laughs> when that plant doesn't have the water it needs, it is going to be stressed and it's going to lose yield. And like I've talked about, when we start thinking about the scale of these microbes, Dennis has used the idea, the, the pictures of the train system in Europe, the, the commuter train versus the freight train, freight train system. the freight train system. So these microbes, they are on a much smaller scale than the plants. So they can sense, like I've talked about, these moisture, these moisture shifts and changes faster than the plant can. Plant growth promoting rhizobacteria reduce evaporation and increase soil water retention. That EPS is hoping that soil creates structure and hold on to that moisture. Uh, PGPR can produce the phytohormones the plant needs. Again, like we talked about, they're producing the abscisic acid, which stimulates the plant to close its stomata. So these soil signals that are coming are being basically relayed from the microbe up into the plant to help it close its stomata faster. Not only that, a lot of these potassium mobilizing bacteria are supplying the plant with the potassium it needs to open and close its stomata more quickly. And it's just incredible. Bioaugmentation with plant growth promoting rice bacteria has the potential to mitigate <clears throat> the adverse effects of drought and heat stress on plants. And it's because of all these things that we've talked about. EPS is creating that structure to hold on to more moisture. Uh, regulation of the antioxidant systems and the enzymes that help break down those reactive oxygen species. The signaling pathways, those hormones that the microbes are using. Again, those osmolites that help the plant hold on to the water, reducing osmosis. Uh, production of the phytohormones. Bacterial ACC deaminase activity, reducing the ethylene levels in the plant. So we can see that these microbes are doing a lot. And here's some of the research that uh, kind of goes in to improve some of these things that were I was just talking about. There is a lot of research that's gone into how these microbes function, which is interesting. And we could spend a whole hour on just that if people were really interested in it. But what we see in the field is what is getting a lot of the farmers really excited. We know the science is there. We know the functionality of these organisms is there to help that plant hold on to more moisture. But when we see it in the field, it can be really exciting. Yeah, you know, this was in Connell, Washington, uh, which is not too far from Spokane, just a little bit south and east or west here of Spokane. And this was a dry land farmer. Uh, we had had absolutely zero precipitation yep. throughout the entire right. summer and into the fall. And he wanted to get his winter wheat in. Wasn't sure he had enough moisture. So he basically uh, went in, planted the wheat, uh, planted it deep. Mm -hmm. And he went back out there. And I want to say it was three days later that he went back out there and he was digging down into his field. And he saw these sprouts of these plants coming up. And he immediately got me on the phone. He's taking pictures. And he's showing these beautiful dreadlocks growing on his winter wheat. Look at that and habitat. Look at that zone of health and life those microbes have generated. And he would say, where is this moisture coming from? How are these guys already germinated within the soil environment? Yeah. But I see that in, I've seen it in Washington. I've seen it in Kansas. I've seen it all across the country. California, New Mexico, get, Arizona. Yeah, oh, yeah. Where we get these environments where we think there's not enough moisture there. But again, we start to talk about that cellulose digestion. Yep. That, that breaking generates that water. Up, that generates mm -hmm. just a little bit of water. Those microbes need water, too. We talked about yep. that last month uh, within the web in our series. And then this was a picture he sent me. I don't remember how long it was, but the the amount of roots. And you talk, Steve, about these microbes will find cooler temperatures, they'll find moisture, and they'll change the morphology. That, the mm -hmm. Morphology of that root into that soil environment. That's really what's happening here, you know. Well, we see that. But you know, again, this was a dry land farmer. As you can see, there's there's not a lot of field debris left on that field right there not in the background much. of no, the picture. Not too much. Not too much. Not um, ideal. But the opposite of that is we kind of see this in this next picture. This is what we're seeing down in the flues here in the springtime. And uh, we're planting basically our spring wheat here. 
And, you know, we so often talk about armor on the soil. We talk mm -hmm. about creating that habitat for that microbial community. But this is kind of what, what we like to see. The problem with this is we talk about temperatures. You know, one of the things when I first met with this grower, he said, this the no-till is all good. They've been doing no-till for 20 years. Yeah. But the problem with that is that's an insulator. It actually keeps that ground cooler. And so he Delaying germination some? Delaying germination. Um, one of the things he noticed on this biological as he started to uh, go down this pathway, and you talked about it, Steve, the germination. Mm -hmm. um, this was when he was planting, this was one of his last planted fields planted, and it was his first field up and out of the ground. Oh, cool. And it comes down to the idea, again, of that temperature that and and those microbial coming out of dormancy, creating that nutrition that that plant needs in order to make an environment conducive for germination and for growth. Yep. Um, so, you know, those are just some of the things that we're, we're kind of seeing, which is really exciting when we start to talk about this regenerative practices and overcoming some of those environmental changes that are thrown at us. Absolutely. So we see this like we've been talking about. We're seeing it in hot, we're seeing it in dry, we're seeing it in cold. Now let's move on. Let's let's tigger <laughs> and and jump over to underwater breathing. And I found this, and I was just this research just is so interesting, and I find it so cool. Underwater breathing plants could be key to stress resistance in crops. Rhizobacterial treatment caused increase in length and diameter of roots, along with expansion of cortex and air and chyma space as compared to uninoculated control. And this, the research was looking at rice as well as maize. We can see this in other crops as well. Air and chyma is not one that, are, were, are you familiar with air and chyma? No. It's, it's not a word that pops up a lot, but this is an adaptation that plants can utilize to encourage gas exchange. When we are in an aerobic, aerobic environment, the plants don't need this. When we start to go anaerobic, when we have low oxygen, respiration is still critical. That plant still needs that gas exchange. So what these microbes are doing is they're helping the plant stimulate the production of air and chyma. And you can see there aren't these little pathways, and here there are the pathways. Same with this maze. We can see these pores. We can see these structures. And I kind of think about them as they're snorkels. They're allowing that plant to move more oxygen from the above grounds where it has access to all the oxygen and gas, gas it needs to below these waterlogged environments, allowing that plant to grow more normally. It's, it's not going to be the healthiest plant, but the idea of having some plant growth versus no plant growth because we've gone anaerobic and we've gone underwater is a big difference. Yeah, it's a buffer. It gets it you through a period of time where we try and get environmental conditions to change so that we can continue yes. on. And that's really what it comes down to. And, you know, we've shown some pictures here of, of the golf course mm -hmm. industry, partly because it's an easy way to show examples. The other thing is because usually they'll let me dig up their crop. Um, <laughs> Um, but here's an example of standing water. We can see that in the golf course yep. industry. We see it out in agriculture yep. fields where we get that, oh, as we talked about, that environmental rain that comes out, that heavy rain precipitation. We get it to stand in a section of the field and we start to see discoloration of those plants. The type of irrigation that's going on, yeah. excessive irrigation, flood irrigation. Yeah. Well, and we talked actually, we talked about our grower specific example of this in Kansas. Uh, just this winter, based off of his irrigation practices of how he ran his pivot, mm -hmm. was creating actually some of the problems that he was having mm -hmm. within his field. And he, we didn't even think about it. That's the way they had done it for a long time. Sure. When we started to think how his irrigation cycle worked, it's exactly what was causing take a the reduced back. yield yep. in one section yep. of that field. Interesting. Um, yeah, so it's pretty interesting. We start to see how all things are connected and you really start to think about it. But the reason I show that picture is if we look at that, some of the things that we see is anaerobic conditions, basically lack of oxygen. Mm -hmm. Here in the golf course, and this is considered black layer. Yeah. Um, you know, you talked about poor root development, uh, low oxygen, no yep. microbial community. Yep. First thing that shows up is a susceptibility to insects and disease. Yes, yeah. that is the first thing that shows up. The plant up. is stressed. This plant is stressed. Um, this was in Colorado, actually, a golf course. The grower was half into water every day because of the environmental conditions. He had no roots. Mm -hmm. If he didn't, it would just turn crispy and it would die. So we got on a biological program. You see the plug here on the right where we started to digest that 
basically organic material, really mm -hmm. black layer. All it is is an incomplete breakdown of organic matter. Yeah. That's really what it is, is that it shifted to. He didn't have the organism of the soil to complete the breakdown process and it shifts anaerobic. So we started to basically build that down. And we see that same thing in agricultural soils. That if we start to create that digestion process mm -hmm. and building that soil structure, being able to actually penetrate water. But the amazing thing about this is what we see happen with the roots within that soil environment. So as you see here on the left, we don't have organic breakdown. We see that there's an aerification hole there. There might be a little root penetrating there where there's a that little bit spot. of oxygen. Yep. Yeah. So when we get that biological community active within that soil environment, we start to digest that organic matter. As you can see here on the right, we've started to break that down. We've got a more even profile. These are, you know, when we talk about an environmental or an, an environment that's not conducive to growing biological communities, a 90% sterile sand, sand-based mm -hmm. green yep. is not a great place to try and get them to grow. No. We really have to pay attention to how we're feeding them to get them to grow. Carbon, but carbon, we, carbon. Yeah, but what we see here is the roots down, that mortality changing within yep. that environment, going down through those profiles. This golf course superintendent now, rather than watering every day, is watering once every fourth or fifth day. When again, I talk about uh, it's huge savings. Yeah, I yeah I talk about yield, not only number of rounds, but reduced water cost mm -hmm. is one of the biggest things in the uh, turf industry, which is true in the agriculture industry. Absolutely, water is. I mean, I talked about a grower in California that's pulling out his kiwis right uh, now yeah. because of the fact he doesn't have enough irrigation water to manage all of his property. That's scary. So these are all things that we have to start to think about. Well, I, looking at these roots, this is sand. And you can see it's hard to see from this scale of the picture, but the EPSs are creating the glues to bind even particles as large as sand. Around, around that, these roots. which is just incredible. Um, another quick pointer, if you go out to your field and you dig it up and you're smelling that rotten egg smell, that hydrogen sulfide, that's because you've gone anaerobic. And in an anaerobic digestion, oxygen, so oxygen is generally used as the, it's called the terminal electron acceptor. So during the respiration, during metabolic processes, oxygen is used as that electron acceptor. When you don't have oxygen available, different organisms start to take over. And in this case, you have sulfur reducing organisms. So rather than using oxygen, they're using sulfur, which leads to that hydrogen sulfide smell. So it, it's kind of a quick, easy, if you can smell it, you know you've got some gas exchange issues. And we're going to see a lot of that in places like California, yeah. which beyond their control, they've been underwater. Oh, yeah. Lake Tulare. Oh, yeah. Another prime example. That's a little different. Yeah. yeah. I mean, first thing we need to do as we get things going is get anaerobic community or aerobic communities okay. into that anaerobic environment yes. and get something actively growing. Yes. Um, salty PGPRs. We talked a lot about um, abiotic stress associated with salt and salt conditions. I'm not going to spend too much more time on this. Um, we can. There's a lot of information. And it's interesting. But I wanted to point out and kind of focus a little bit on this idea. When there's salt in the environment, both of these organisms are exposed to it, and therefore they both have to deal with it. And that's when I point out this idea of the osmoprotectants, these structures and these materials that help that organism deal with that stress. And through rhizophagy, through the feeding, the plant is receiving those. So when we look over on this chart, we see the idea of osmosis stress, Osmolites are generated. We have antioxidants that are generated by these microbes to help protect the plant. Breaking down the ethylene, the ACC deaminase, and again, those volatile organic compounds. It's incredible how just the microbe gases can stimulate upregulation of genes responsible for moving sodium out of the plant tissue back out of the root into the soil environment, which can then be bound up by these extracellular polysaccharides. I kind of think about this as if you're building something out of stone or brick, you need mortar to, to bind those together. These EPSs are the mortar. They're the glue that hold that together. And the beauty is just like you can mix some other stuff into your mortar, these microbes can purposefully put some of the sodium into that mortar to bind it up, tie it up and get rid of it, which is just absolutely incredible. So we've, we've bounced around a lot. We've, we've done a pretty good job. I think we'd make Winnie the Pooh or Christopher Robin pretty happy, happy. <laughs> with, with what we've done. We've, we've talked a lot of, we talked a little bit about heat, about low temperatures and droughts. 
if if there's interest, we can talk about heavy metals uh, next time. I think we've kind of run out of time for this time. Well over. Yeah, uh, a, 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 if it's supposed a, to be a half hour, then we might have we might have put a little bit too well, much into this. One. And you know, so much of this as we talk, I always okay. say that you know, in agriculture, we so often focus on nutrient availability and yield and soil structure, but there's mm -hmm. so much more going on in that soil environment that we yeah. have to have an understanding of other benefits mm -hmm. that these beneficial bacteria give us within that, which are getting us, helping us get through those stress periods in agriculture. Because that's, as we started out this presentation, that's really what it's all about, mm -hmm. is these environmental stresses that are being thrown at us yeah. as growers that we have very little control over. Mm -hmm. So with, with that idea in mind, as we've said before, and we'll say again, a plant can only use the tool it has access to. If we have done something to remove, reduce, decline, anything, these beneficial species, a plant no longer has access to. <clears throat> and like we saw with like that Pseudomonas putida helping with cold, that's a specific organism doing a specific job. A lot of these organisms have different capacities and capabilities. And that's why diversity is so critical and it's so important. So we've got to get our friends out there so they can do the job that we expect them to do. Yeah, it comes down, as you said, a lot. Uh, communication. Yes. If there's the signal sent down into that soil environment and that organism is not in mm -hmm. that soil environment, that call goes unanswered. Yep. So, you know, when you look at this picture here on the left and you see this root was surrounded by these beneficial bacteria, and I believe this was uh, That's Bacillus, Bacillus, Bacillus yeah. um, that we show Think about that when you look at that corn plant and all of these roots, all these fine hair roots, if we lit that up with the green glow, what that would look like within that soil environment, because that's really how we have to look at it. That is one root, a, one little section of the plant mm -hmm. and all those beneficials growing around that plant, protecting that plant, making nutrient availability you know, EPSs, the pHs, yep. EPSs, all those things we talked about today. Now just magnify that over to this corn plant. It's pretty exciting. It, it, our fields would literally be glowing and exactly. it would just be incredible. So keep that in mind. Think about that. Whenever we're doing something that's going to harm those organisms, we're reducing this protective layer. And as we reduce this protective layer, I mean, think about it like your engine. If you don't have enough oil to protect your parts, they're going to break down. These microbes are the buffer between the harsh environmental conditions and the health of that. And I think Dr. Huber talked some about specific organisms that are um, damaged by the application of different herbicides oh, and fungicides yeah. within that. So it's really interesting when you start to look at that based off of specific microbial strains mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that have been impacted by agricultural practices I mean, and things that show up afterwards because yeah. you don't have it. No, even like the bigger picture, the idea of copper and sulfur, which are fantastic generally within range. But then when we start applying excessive amounts of them, we start to see declines in our mycorrhizal fungi. And then I've, I've heard people and seen some research talking about as you reduce those mycorrhizal fungi, you start to see propagation of more of the weeds that are non-mycorrhizal. You see more red root pigweed. You see more lamb's quarter. It just, all these things, all these things are interconnected and it's just so cool. Okay. With that, I think we'll, we'll stop geeking out. Thank you, everybody. Um, <laughs>